of you have met and spoken with, or certainly at least seen, Mr. Kingdon Gould, who is one of the founders of GCS. In this uh, 60th anniversary year of our school, I know how proud Mr. Gould is to be sitting in front of you, students who are here at the school that he founded 60 years ago. So we know Mr. Gould in that context as the, the man who founded our school. We sit in buildings named after him. But what we don't know about him is, is much about his own personal history. And um, he is here today with one of his many grandchildren, Franco Gould, who is also a veteran. Mr. Gould's uh, story is, is an interesting one. And he was uh, um, early on in college when World War II was on and left college to join the service. And um, as a result of his service, he is the recipient of two Purple Hearts and two Silver Stars for Valor. Um, so he has an interesting story to tell, and his grandson Franco also enhanced that story, um, bringing it up to date with uh, some interesting aspects of modern military service. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Kingdon Gould and his grandson Franco. tell you about my outfit and what they accomplished. We're not really a military family. However, over these years, four generations of us have served. My father was in World War I, I was in two, and my son on the right hand was a parachuter, a volunteer, and joined the service after high school. And my grandson has just completed almost 10 years of service in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And because there's been such a change in the nature of the makeup of the army and in the nature of the warfare today, I thought it was a heck of a lot more relevant for you who may be going in the service to hear from him than from my experience, which is 17, 17 years old now. It seems difficult to remember where, way back that far. I was just out of high school, just graduating the way you 12th graders will complete in the spring. And the war that was taking place was in a bad state from the American point of view. The Japanese were pretty much in control of Asia and the Pacific Islands and Ocean. And Germany had already expanded into France and had taken over Czechoslovakia, as you know and even some countries that claim they were non-belligerents like the Netherlands. And the war then, at that time of my graduation, was taking place in Africa. 
and it wasn't going well in any one of the sectors. So having been just admitted to college that spring, colleges in those days, because of the war, operated around the year rather than having summer vacations. But I resigned and from college in New Haven and volunteered for the cavalry, hoping to see a horse. But strangely enough, this was the period when horses were phased out from military operations and vehicles replaced This is the outfit that I was assigned, which, uh, assigned to, which is Troop C of the 36th Cavalry. They still retained the name Cavalry, although there were no horses. Next, please. And replacing the horses were Jeeps. Next. armored cars, which were motorized vehicles with rubber tires rather than tracks like a tank, and carried a 30 millimeter cannon. And the theory of the cavalry as being mechanized was for scout vehicles and jeeps men in vehicles like jeeps to go down the road until you contacted the enemy and then if needed to have the protection of an armored car. Next please. And then we had vehicles, half track vehicles, which also contained weapons and were designed to bring troops into battle. Next, please. And a strange vehicle called the Duck, which was designed to go across water. Next, please. And so, our first experience was basic training, which is where you learn the way the Defense Department is structured, the way the military is structured, the nomenclature, and the activities. And we were stationed in California for a good bit of our training period. And here you can see the way they were inspecting the vehicles which had to be cleaned with a what to be curled satisfaction with a white glove. So we took excellent care of our vehicles and we also learned how to use weapons and take them apart and how to use them. Maintain them. Next, please. There's another view of our vehicles stationed for inspection. Again, please. And we went out to California and to a part of Arizona that was very, very hot for desert training because, again, it was uncertain where the next phase of world war would take place and we had been fighting in North Africa, as you know. Next, please. And there's my friend King Tugu looking like an idiot. <laughs> next, please. And so, after we had basic training, we went among maneuvers 
what its maneuvers? Well, it's like playing a practice game for a sports team. You don't have live ammunition. You have simulated ammunition, but you've learned the various tactics, maneuvers, and so forth, and you have half of the troops lined up on one, not lined up, but on one side, and the other half of the troops on the other side, and you practice the various mechanical operations with the vehicles that we had in our troop. Then one day we went to the East Coast and boarded ship to go across the Atlantic because the Army in its wisdom, having trained us for desert activity, now was sending us to follow after D-Day and go to Europe, which at that time was very cold and very snowy. So having prepared us in the desert, we wound up in snowbound Europe. And this is the type of town that we would be going through. Could I see the other food? As you can see, these all towns have been severely bombed and damaged. Next. Again, another one. And here is one of our armored cars, which was hopefully disguised a little bit so that it wouldn't be too evident. At this time in Army warfare, there was no television, there were no electronic communication system other than radio, which was just emerging to, make, to communi communicate back and forth between forces that were in the front and forces that were in the rear. And that's a whole new generation now in which technology will play a major part in warfare. Next, please. I can show you where we were stationed along the Roar River. Here's the Roar River. Not the Roar, but the Roar River. And <clears throat> this was the first mission that our outfit received in which we were under fire. This was the, the time of the Battle of the Bulge. As you know, General von Rundstedt, the German commander, had created a large force which had burst through the American and Allied lines and gone considerably into territory of the Allied forces had just recaptured from the Germans. And so all the troops that were in the area of the Allied troops were taken to compress the bulge and 
important the Poles came through this area here to a place called Batcoin, a town called Bat. Batcoin. And then were compressed by Allied forces from the north and south, including General Patton's force from the south. And so, at that time, our mission for our troop was to hold the line which had been reduced in number of forces protecting the area from additional invasion. And we were stationed along the Roar River and connected to the British forces were, which were on the north most part forcing their way across Belgium and northern Germany. Eventually the bulge was compressed. The Germans were first forced to retreat and from then we performed a cavalry function of leading the Allied forces and other forces, not other, but the Allied forces, meaning the American and German and English, uh, I'm not German, excuse me, guys. The Allied forces composed of France, England, and the US, mainly. And they went across on this blue line as you can see was the line of march could I have the next picture please this is a picture of the bridge across the Rhine River the Remagen Bridge which had been captured by American troops, amazingly enough because the Germans had destroyed all the other bridges over the Rhine, and the Rhine provided the major protection for the, that part of Germany that had not been, become, not been taken. Could I have the next picture, please? And the Germans, unfortunately, as you can see, were able to bomb it before we got a lot of troops over, but we got a bridgehead across the Rhine. Next, please. And our outfit, after crossing the Rhine, the blue line here, continued on until they reached the Elba River. Now all of this is expressed in this little book which was put together by the government called From the Elba to the, from the Roar to the Elba River. And that is where we were told to stop rather than an advance on Berlin. And I have here a wonderful, which I'll leave if anybody is interested, I'll leave with you here, a, a wonderful diary from what I consider the modern day Cincinnati. A friend of mine who composed the four years of his army until the day he was discharged. And this is a 
very accurate and a dull boy's kind of view as distinguished from the military histories that are composed by the historians that are officially putting it together. And the reason that we stopped at the Elba River because of a commitment that our president, then Franklin Roosevelt, had made with the head of the Russian nation, Stalin, to allow the Russians to take Berlin. And that was over the objection of Winston Churchill, who was the head of the British government. He foresaw that that would lead to consequences not good for the Allied forces of the Allied countries. And you've heard of the Cold War. Well, the decision to allow the Russians to occupy Berlin and then later to build the Berlin Wall to keep those Germans still in that eastern part of Germany from going to the west created the so-called Cold War. And while we were waiting at the Elba River, my friend, could you read this for us, Frank, wrote about this part. Can you hear me? Uh, we waited three days for the Russians to come up and I think that was one of the most dramatic times of the war for me. The small village on the river had been made safe, and one day we saw people on horses approaching. They were Russian horse cavalries. They were mean-looking men with mustaches and black Turkish-looking caps. I think it was the next day that our second platoon squad was chosen to escort the colonel and our officers, we can't remember which officers men, to meet some Russian officers. One of them, the most beautiful sights that I've ever seen was when we were standing on our side of the river and our beautiful stars and stripes was unfurled in the breeze and the Russians unfurled their red hammer and sickle flag on their side. The bright colors of the flag were almost shocking after all the months of drab, colorless war. A GI from our party went across the river in a canoe to talk to the Russians and the Russians knew of a place where they could cross the river. We met them there, and they came over to our side, and the officers went into a house to talk. While the officers talked, we got friendly with the ordinary Russian soldiers. One of our men, Jancic, I think, could talk Polish, and some of the Russians could talk Polish. The officers in the house were getting louder, and there, were a, there was a lot of laughter, and then some shooting. Someone said that they were shooting at a picture of Hitler. When the meeting came to an end, our officers came wobbling out. I guess plenty of vodka had flowed. My squad, 2nd platoon, escorted our officers to meet the Russians on the Elbe River. And that was the vision of my friend, the dirt farmer from San Antonio, Texas, wrote as part of his diary, which I'll leave with you. Now, I would like to say that I completed the trip, but unfortunately I incurred some injury and wound up hospitalized, so I was not able to keep on track all the way to the upper river. However, that is almost the end of my story. Could I have the 
next picture, please. At one time, during the West Area, when we were on the Roar River holding the line, we were able to leave and have a rest period of a couple of weeks. And it was my pleasure to have been put up by some Dutch people, a Dutch family that I met after the war and was able to make friends with again and here we are all together and that's almost the end of my story but 40 years later we got our troop together and retraced if I could go back and retrace the blue line that you see here. And we were very welcomed, very warmly welcomed by the countries that the US and its allies had liberated. And so that was the 40th anniversary that I was glad to attend. Now, I know that there are three important things about public speaking, stand up, speak up, shut up, and I should have done that a little while ago, but I'd like you to present any questions you might have about the Army, as it is today, and the Army with, in use of technology and where we're going. And so my grandson, who spent the last 10 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, is here. Franco. Hello, everybody. Um, I suppose I'd open up questions uh, for, for any of you if you have any 
questions about the professional army as it stands today. But, um, I'll just step, step in for a second. So um, we, uh, they might have questions for the both of you, actually. But if we think right now in terms of uh, their service, I'll step out of the way. <laughs> their service, I wonder, uh, Mr. Gould, if you would speak to, he was also an ambassador to the Netherlands and Luxembourg, correct? And uh, how did your experience in the service impact your ability to help negotiate as an ambassador for the United States? Well, actually my experience in the service only put me in touch with the non-influential groups, people in the service, rather than understanding the way in which the wars were taking place and the decisions of the General Eisenhower and his advisors as to where to go. So it was a different type of service, which I'd be glad to speak about someday. Okay. So but they were pretty much interrelated, and I was fortunate when I came back from Europe still find a place in college and complete my degree. But I think it's important that we maintain a strong military because, as you can see, and as Frank has told you, constantly the world is changing. So that whereas we were bombing Germany, and doing everything we could to destroy them at the same time that they were trying to do everything they could to destroy Great Britain with their buzz bombs. Now we see that German forces and American forces were alive in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Franco has told you that. So we go back and forth. But the important thing is that we maintain a strong force at the national level, both Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and leading those divisions of our armed services. You may want to consider a career at West Point or Annapolis. I know that my experience in the service was very enlightening to me, although it was not a, really the command levels was more at the ground level. Franco, you have a question next. <laughs> I don't want to mischaracterize, uh, you know, how difficult service can be. I'm going to let me stand up here. Yeah, you can, or you can take it. Sure. Um, I, I don't want to misrepresent how difficult it can be. Uh, certainly, you know, my grandfather said he, he received an injury. He was he was wounded, that's a very different distinction. These are very, um, it's a very different reality than, than the peace that we enjoy in this country. Having said that, um, the military is a, a very sophisticated place in the forefront of a lot of different technological fields. I received an extensive amount of training in medicine to the extent that it, it's something I will never forget and will be with me forever. Uh, I've learned other skill sets uh, that, I, that I rely on on a daily basis, but um, we do have a very divided society these days where very few people 
uh, really understand what kind of, of sacrifice people in the military make. Uh, and, the, and the families, the, the husbands and wives and the, the fathers and mothers, and certainly the children. We have more and more young children that are the children of people that are continue to go uh, back overseas. And uh, I think it's important that people uh, understand that sacrifice and, and the, the difficulty. Um, nevertheless, uh, service is something that is uh, important for a strong society. And I, I don't want to encourage uh, people to take on uh, something like that without understanding that it is a, a, a sacrifice and it is difficult. You both, uh, in these roles, uh, as a medical doctor, then working with the med team, and uh, as uh, someone who is in peacekeeping, as an ambassador, your ability to communicate with people, and to negotiate, and to uh, find a level playing field among conflict uh, becomes important. We have a global curriculum here where we're trying to help students learn to communicate with conflict and see and kind of study the conflicts around the world right now. Um, I wonder if there are questions for them right now. We'll like take two questions and then, well, I'm sorry that we're we'll gonna need to be done. But some two, two questions for them, anyone over here, Tessa? Um, what is your proudest achievement from your service? Proudest achievement from your service. I guess the understanding of how the army functions and how warfare is so dangerous when it becomes actually firefighting and not just maneuvers. I would say to you that one of the big advantages that I had was that I spoke several languages which I learned. I, mean, I would encourage to, you students to pursue facility in language, not just as I did in the European languages, but in Arabic, Chinese, other languages from the emerging nations. Proudest moment for you? Uh, I was able to treat people that needed help. Um, there were some very brave uh, Afghans in this case who volunteered to serve as our interpreters um, for many deployments. A team would return to the United States and another one would come to replace them as the deployment cycle goes. And, and these young gentlemen uh, continued to serve in that capacity um, for, for years. And at the direction of my, my Special Forces team leader, uh, I went through the process of legally filing the paperwork and moving through the bureaucratic process to help these uh, interpreters come to the United States. And there are two gentlemen with their wives and, and six children in total that live in Reston, Virginia. I uh, count them as my close friends and uh, I was able to help them get their permanent residence here in the United States. Um, those are the two. We'll take one more. Cameron. Oh, um, how were you greeted when you returned home after the war? As a veteran, how were you greeted after you returned home? Well, we were welcomed at the dock side as our vessels came into the harbor. I came into Austin and by that time had forgotten the telephone. Teammates, former teammates, uh, they just left last week for Afghanistan and they come and go as the as the deployment cycle requires. So in the older case there was a long boat over and a long boat back. Now we have this constant flow of, of professional soldiers going off and coming back. Um, and I would say that while I served, Skype was invented. 
which uh, is kind of a double-edged sword because um, sometimes you need separation and distance between war and talking to your wife, girlfriend, mother, father, um, Thanksgiving, uh, you know, and it's not always the most appropriate thing if uh, you're getting ready to go uh, on a mission to be seeing your, your loved ones in that regard. It's a kind of a disruptive technology in terms of that, that system. Just something to, to think about. Um, as far as the reception by uh, the American community, this is a wonderful, uh, a, a wonderful event to honor uh, the generation that's gone before us. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been it's been fine. I think that the, the message today is that it's still going, and it doesn't seem to. Uh, you know, that's a reality. Kind of modern uh, modern military service. Well, I think we're going to have one more thank you. No, uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being so Thank you.